Welcome everyone to another episode of Financial 15, a new original series, another Becker original series. We're talking about behavioral finance, the psychology of money. Today we're looking at cognitive biases. What are they? How do they affect our decisions? More importantly, how do you minimize them? Lots of great information. You definitely want to stick around. Yeah, as Clint mentioned, another original series. We've done housing. We've done cryptocurrencies. We are presenting you today with behavioral finance or the psychology of investing sort of scenarios. Now, if you want to find these or any of the other original series we've done, please go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Lots of great content there. You'll be able to find out everything you need to on those topics and more. Or if you want, like us on Facebook. And please, please visit our website at beckeror.com. There's great, great amounts of stuff for you there, whether it's in blogs, whether it's in video, or whether it's just questions you need to ask. So today, though, we want to start with our series on behavioral finance. There is so much to cover in this topic, but today we're starting sort of with what are cognitive biases? Clint, why don't you start off what the behavioral biases are? Yeah, well, I'll start with a definition. We should say up front, this is not always a, a bad thing. I mean, it should no. be made aware of them and then you can try to improve your decision-making ability, but we're gonna go through a couple of the biases, show how they can have an impact uh, on what you're doing in a few ways you might wanna be aware of them to minimize them, but to start off with behavioral biases, it's really the idea that you're systematically favoring certain income, incomes, outcomes, incomes, okay. certain <laughs> outcomes over others, and it might not be for rational reasons. You're doing so for a couple of reasons. Maybe it's because of emotion, because of a cognitive idea, but you're favoring some outcomes over others. You can break it down into two categories. Today, we're talking about the first category, cognitive biases, which is the idea it's uh, improper information processing, a memory error, perhaps an error with statistics. But the idea is for those reasons, it has faulty rationale and that's leading to the outcome. Or you could have an emotional bias, which as the name implies, could be an impulse and intuition. Maybe your feelings are influencing the reasoning, which will again, alter the outcome. So that's uh, the, in a nutshell, behavioral mm -hmm. biases. So we'll jump into that, Kevin. I'm going to pull one up. We're just going to jump right into them. We know what they are. Let's start going through a couple of these cognitive biases. We're looking at that category within yep. behavioral biases. So here's the, here's the first one for a recency bias. What's that all about? Well, th that basically deals with events that you've seen recently and things that have happened that you, you seem or, or think they're going to happen again. So, you know, uh, it can be as recent as, well, you know, the pandemic happened in 2000. We saw a bit of a collapse going there. 40%. We're now in a market where it's going down. Okay, it's only down 25. It's going to go down 40 because we saw it the last time. Or, you know, this is the same as it was back in the early 80s because inflation's going up. Oh, my gosh, it's going to hit double digit or 14, 15%. I got to worry about it. So these are the recency biases that we tend to look at is that things that have happened before are going to happen the exact same way again. And of course, we know that in reality, certain things do follow a pattern, but it's not always the same. We may have had stagflation with unemployment as well as high inflation. Here, we've got full employment with high inflation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. again, differences go on, but our recency biases tend to deal with some of this aspect in yeah. figuring out what we want to do. So it's a perceptual filter, right? We're overweighting yeah. with things that happened recently, and then we extrapolate from that essentially yes. what we're doing, right? So there's lots of information out there. Instead of doing a weight of the evidence and going through all the details, we're kind of overweighting what happened recently and saying, all right, that's probably going to keep going. And we're extrapolating that and using that to predict our outcomes. So that could obviously, in fact, impact investing. You might be chasing the hot sector, the one that's doing real well now. Well, we got to jump on that one. So we're going to chase the return. It could obviously impact uh, how you deal with insurance because if you're overweighting the recent stuff, that means you're really not paying attention to those items that were far enough back. No. And you might think, oh, those are not improbable events. It won't happen to me. So it can impact how you deal with insurance. It can impact how you deal with retirement spending, overweighting exactly. insurance spending, not getting an accurate picture of uh, the long term. So a number of ways that can play in is the recency bias. We'll go to a second cognitive bias here. One I think we're all guilty of. And again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means you need to be aware of it. And it's mental accounting. Like money is money. Like yeah. if you earn money, whether it is through salary, whether it is through bonus, it's us that determines the category, right? We put it into a certain bucket, but you can spend it all the same. Whether it's money That's from income, one. money from bonus, money from inheritance, you can't. You go to the grocery store; they still accept the money. They don't question. Oh, that's bonus money. You can't spend that here on groceries. <laughs> you can't, or else. It's us that puts it into these separate buckets, these separate categories, and treats it differently when money is ultimately fungible. And that's essentially the bias, right? And that can lead to a whole 
sort of different outcomes. Uh, a positive one might be budgeting. You have different money for different category and you yeah. only spend what's in that bucket and you don't go beyond it. So that's not a bad thing. Exactly. I mean, it, it makes a lot of those sense scenarios. I mean, I always remember the line from Paul Newman, the color of money, money earned is twice as sweet as, or money, money won is twice as sweet as money earned. Money doesn't care. As long as you've got it, you can spend it and you can spend it anywhere. But you're right. Budgeting is one sort of scenario or also just the way you break down things. I mean, if you plan your year, as you mentioned beforehand, over your salary, well, that's all you get. If you get a nice bonus at the end of the year, oh, well, you know, that's spent for something special. I can only use it on something. Well, no, yeah. I mean, you can utilize it in a case like this with high gas prices, maybe I'm gonna use it for more of the practical things I was doing beforehand. But you're right, that mental accounting bias, and you, you mentioned the head-on head on scenario was, budgeting's the biggest one probably of that whole thing. You've got everything categorized to put into certain areas. And again, as you've mentioned, money doesn't care. As long as you've got it, and you can spend it somewhere, that's what you really can do with it. But we all are accustomed to mental accounting bias. And you said, it is not a bad thing to have this as an option, an aptitude to deal with going forward, but it is something that you have to be aware of when you're dealing with how you deal with money in general. Yeah. And a few other ways it can come in. You, you mentioned salary versus bonus. It's all money, but we might treat yep. it differently because of how we earned it and when it, we get received as a lump sum versus little bits over time. Inheritance would fall into that category as well. Yes. On the investment side, sometimes People treat dividends special as if it's not as good or as better than a capital gain. Whereas in the end, if the portfolio goes up, in my view, that's a win. If it goes up, it does a capital gain versus dividend. Irrelevant. I'm not sure I'd put that much of an emphasis on it. But again, that's mental accounting, trying to put the, the money in different little buckets, right? So it's not necessarily yeah. a bad thing, but certainly something to be aware of. We'll quickly go to a third one. And I'll let you enunciate this one because it's a bit of a mouthful, Kevin. Representativeness bias. That's right. probably the easiest one. So when we're dealing <laughs> when we're dealing with it, it's sort of the representation of you know where we are with with um, the scenarios that are going on with the money that we have. Uh, it, it's more of a generalized scenario that you know deals with odds and ends in how we've broken things down. Would it not classify some of that? Yeah, yeah. It's a, we go through emotional experiences. We want those experiences to matter. So we create these perceptual filters and then we might overweight them. New information comes in. We don't really give that new information the proper due diligence. We say, oh, no. I've seen this movie before. This is like when I went through 2008 or this is like the dot com bubble or like the 80s or whatever period had emotional significance to us. We overweight that experience and we don't give the new information enough attention. We just immediately put it into this bucket. We say, oh, no, this is a representative piece of info related to this past event, this past perceptional filter. And that can lead to all sorts of trouble. <laughs> yes. There's no guarantee that this new info is in fact going to be what you think it is in that prior situation. That prior situation might be an extreme. It might be an anomaly. There's no guarantee it will be repeated and you're not properly evaluating the information. You just put in that bucket because it, it meet, meets uh, a prior perceptual frame. Yeah, history does not always repeat itself, as we've said. And again, it does have its own categorization, but as you put, because, you know, if you remember the dot-com bubble, anytime mm -hmm. you start to get dots, the, the tech stocks running away, you're going to think this is the same scenario that goes on again. Things have not changed. I have to worry about it. So there is some recency bias as well in that because it's something that you might have seen beforehand and you're categorizing that that way. But again, another different bucket that you can put your money into as a representation or as a representativeness bias. Going yeah, forward. Some of these biases, they kind of bleed together. So you, yeah. is one really discreet from the other. You can argue a bit of that. But uh, this one, absolutely investments. We talked about how that could be an impact. If you think, oh, yes. this investment situation is very similar to the last one. Uh, again, financial planning, retirement. If you had an experience where your parents went through a certain kind of retirement, or maybe that's your, your view of retirement now. So as information comes in related to retirement, you're going to run it through that perceptual lens. And that could bias how you make decisions about retirement. Maybe they retired very, very early and you now think that's the norm, right? You have to be aware of that kind of bias. Again, not necessarily bad, but just something to be aware of. We kind of answered this question as we went through the three examples, <laughs> but it kind of gets to the idea of why are these important? Well, it can impact your decisions, right? Not that's the biggest a bad thing, but maybe it'll make you be yeah. more risky, less risky. Maybe you won't fully uh, understand the plan when it comes to retirement or your spending patterns, but it can impact all of those decisions that's why it's important, right, Kevin? Yeah, I think that's the key area is the fact that you may not realize that this is what you have. And I think it's a definition that you have to really look at as to where things are going. I mean, you'll get people that will call in and say, well, I want to buy this stock or I want to sell this stock. Well, why are we doing that? Is it a cognitive bias that you've had? Your parents have always owned banks, so you're owning banks. That's representativeness. 
Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you know, is it recency? Is it something with the pandemic? So knowing why you're doing this, or at least having that aspect is important because it helps with your decision making and it'll help you to influence how your retirement may work out or how your investing may go going forward. These are not, like I say, the emotional side of things, but they are stuff that you have to really take a look at because each one of these things, every one of us does in some sort of format. Absolutely. And then it's a matter of putting the real information that's out there in getting there, isn't it? Yeah, the, the idea is, well, if you know they're there, how do you minimize them? What, do you, can, what can you do about it? And, and this can be applied to really anything. We're using a financial lens because that's what we do We're in the financial yes. world. But of course, these biases are broader than just in the financial uh, area. They can apply to any kind of system, any kind of big decision. But in the financial area, how do you handle it? Well, ha write things down. Have a plan, whether that's on investing, managing your own money. Well, why did you buy this stock? How does it fit in with your overall plan? When are you going to sell it? Whatever the rationale is, you have that written in a discrete process. Well, when new information comes in, well, you pull out your notes. So, well, I own this because of whatever it is. Exactly. You're controlling some of the decision making. You're making it a little more automated. You're making it more process driven. It helps control some of these biases. And then on the financial planning side, we feel like a broken record. We always say this, but it relates to, <laughs> to the, a known fact. Same idea. You have a written plan. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing. I mean, most people don't seem to realize the minute you write things down, you are much more likely to hold to what you've written down or mm -hmm. do what you've written down as opposed to saying, oh, I do have a financial plan. My plan is I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And then by this age, I'll be fine. But nothing's written down. Nothing's determined. Five years down the road, you won't remember anything that you said at that point in time. But if you have it written down, you're much more likely to A, reconsult what you did and okay, well, this is why I did it. Yeah, those still hold true. Or this isn't why things are going on. And this is the way I need to go moving forward. So you're right. Having that financial plan, we're beating it to death like a dead horse. But it is a very important part that has to be done. And it does apply with all biases, whether it's the psychology of here or whether you're dealing with it and other things in your life. Having the plan is always a good idea. Exactly. And it helps with the decision making. It helps minimize these biases because you've got a written framework for you to work through and for you to reference uh, again mm -hmm. and again. So it is very key, whether it's handling your investments, financial plan, have that written plan. Uh, if you have more questions, we're going to do more videos on this topic. This is just an introduction. we got a lot more coming. We have emotional biases. We'll go through the seduction of negative items. And again and again, there's going to be a few of these videos. So you can watch for those. Additional questions, chat with clintonkevin.com. We'd love to hear from you. Go to the site, fill in the form. Those come directly to us. Anything you want to add, Kevin? No, I think that's good. We've done cognitive biases today. We're going to get into emotional ones. And as you mentioned, this series could go on and on and on because there is a ton of psychology that goes into investing as well as other things. And we're learning everything that we can to make sure you have all the information. Sounds good. We'll see you again soon with another video. Take care.